And delivering the benefits of 5G requires an end-to-end -end approach that includes devices, RAN, and core networks. In 2015, Telstra, an early adopter of LTE technology, worked with network partner Ericsson that to drive standards, test new concepts, and research new architectures for 5G technologies. Telstra's and Ericsson's collaborative 5G lab evaluations and field trials helped determine the role that machine type communications had in 5G through demonstrations, applications for next generation wireless technologies. At Mobile World Congress 2016, TINL will discuss 5G test trials for or with Telstra's Chief Technology Officer Vishnan Lal and Ericsson's Senior Vice President and Group CTO Ulf Walton to deepen our understanding of the latest innovations architectures and use cases for the future of 5G and gentlemen welcome to the program. Thank you Abe. Thanks Abe. I'm glad I got through that introduction. <laughs> a little bit longer than I expected. Ulf, uh, great to have you here. It's our first time talking to you. No better venue here than Mobile World Congress and Vish as always uh, great to have you and thanks for your time. Thanks Abe. Ulf, I'm going to start with you. It wasn't long ago, actually it was here at Mobile World Congress last year where you um, demonstrated really the one of the first, if not the first, 5G device and really the capability of that device. Um, what impact did that have on your partners and customers? Well, I think quite a lot because it was the first time that we were really showing 5G live. Um, the device was one thing, but we also had the base station, of course. Uh, Ericsson has been working at 5G about three to four years, if you look at the, at the real span of what we've been doing. In uh, 2014, we were the first one to announce a uh, five gigabit throughput by just using a wider carrier. Uh, we call that the phase one of the test beds, and that's what we demonstrated here last year. What it did to our partners and to customers of us was that it really made people see that this is now happening. We, we have since then announced about 20 different partnerships with operators and partners to bring this forward and we're very proud and happy to be working with Telstra on really defining architecture and creating the ecosystem that's going to be needed for 5G. Vish Ericsson testing new concepts and architectures on Telstra's platforms. How does that take you and in, in, in the industry from 4G to 5G? You know, uh, Telstra is in that Goldilocks zone of carriers um, and it makes us a, a great partner with Ericsson using their full stack RAN we're really able to you know, really stress test the edges of some of these technologies. Um, over the course of uh, the past few weeks, we've been rolling out a commercial implementation of LTE Advanced, where we've uh, recently hit a gigabit per second. Um, some pretty dramatic headline speeds. That was largely the result of taking the depth of spectrum assets that Telstra has, up to 100 megahertz, of actual carrier channelization to come up with a gigabit per second. And we're now going to be rolling that out commercially to our customers um, using some new category 17 devices. So it's a first in its field because we've got this uh, great balance of tremendous spectrum assets in very unique geographies in Australia. It presents itself as a really interesting test bed for Ericsson to step in and really try to reinvent the future of where cellular is going. Ulf, you've been asked this question, I'm sure, before. You have 100 times the speed in 5G technology, 1,000 times capacity uh, in 5G technology. We talked about a number of applications that that can benefit over the last couple of years, but what are some new applications that we're talking about now? Well, I think in 5G, it's crystal crystallizing out to a number of different areas. It's great to be here at the Mobile World Congress 16 and just seeing that vertical industries are adopting their, their thinking to what 5G can really provide. It was somewhat relevant if you go back a year or a couple of years. Now it's really relevant. We see uh, core manufacturers showing that they have connections. We see a lot of different things. And if I can categorize it a little bit and try to look in, one very important is all the sensors. Because 5G will have this amazing capability of a very low powered sensor that it might be just to sleep and wake up when you need it. I think that's going to be really a fantastic use case. Then you have the whole media thing. And uh, I'm also very happy to, to, to talk to Telstra about that because Telstra is one of the pioneers when it comes to media and media evolutions. And here 5G will really dramatically change that. We're going to see uh, 4K television over this, etc. Very broadband capability. Then you have the whole area of smart vehicles, transport, and the ability to build smart cities and these kind of things. Here 5G will play a central role because it can connect into all those different things. Then, 
comes a very interesting use case, which is the one about critical control over remote devices. Here you can actually remote control things, and, and we're showing in the Ericsson exhibition, for example, remote control of drones and these kind of things, where 5G can be that kind of technology. And then, last but not least, you will have a human interaction part in 5G that is totally different from what we've had in previous generations. In other words, when you push a screen somewhere, you will get an immediate sense. It will, the system is so fast that the humans are not the any limit anymore. It's actually the machines that it's built for. So therefore, humans will feel an immediate, something that we call haptic control. And that is a very hot topic, but now it can really happen, and 5G is going to be the technology and the network piece that's going to make that happen. Vish, uh, Wolf talked about some of the uh, applications of that uh, 5G can benefit. Let's talk about some of the verticals that 5G can, can benefit it as well, but particularly about machine type communications. Why is that a critical component of 5G? Yeah, machine type communications is really that, that bookend between the, you know, the big headline speeds and really the, the kind of slower speeds that are characterized by these sensors that Wolf talked about. Um, and when you get into machine type communications, you get into this really this new era of mobile broadband, which is much more defined by the micro segmentation that is involved. You're really trying to create an affinity between different types of vertical industries and the network itself, which is pretty exciting. So you can imagine if you have an HVAC machine that's mounted on the top of, uh, of, of your building. Uh, today you've got to send up someone uh, to you know, load a thumb drive of all the statistics that come off that HVAC so that uh, the actual manufacturers can do some optimizations for the settings and you know, how quickly they cool down and when it ramps up and ramps down. Um, with something like machine type communications, that telemetry can be sent to a central control. Uh, and it can be married up with demand response rates, the electricity grid, as well as uh, with the, in the environment. So you can understand how hot or cold it is. And so now you can get an intelligent action being done in that device where it can actually start to cool down the building ahead of peak times uh, when it knows that there's going to be um, you know, an incredibly hot day at 30 degrees Celsius weather. So it gives you this new degree of freedom uh, to optimize for cost and for comfort uh, in a building environment. You can see that play out in a grander scale at a manufacturing facility where I don't just have to instrument you know, the big boilers um, or the motors that are running across my production room floor. Because I'm bringing this new connectivity platform, this machine type communications platform to the equation, I don't need these proprietary systems. I can bust that up and create uh, communications horizontal that allows me to get to a revolution of the cheap. So now I can go after those pieces that do have impact, impact to the uptime of my assembly floor, um, but I can actually uh, go right down into something like the ball bearings, and you know, while they, well, th they're probably not the first thing that you want to monitor, they actually govern the uptime of the conveyor belts. So mm -hmm. if I can understand when they wear and tear, I can do maintenance on them, I can preserve the capacity of my production. Um, so things like that are really going to change the dynamic of how industry and enterprise works. Well, if you started your 5G, 5G uh, your real 5G concept, proof of concept demonstration last year, again, I'm sure this year, when people come into your booth and they view this 5G demonstration, do you still feel like they don't fully realize the capability of 5G, and, and why is that? Do you agree or disagree? Well, I, I, I don't agree, because I think they really can start to see that the technologies that we talked about before 5G existed, we talked about an evolution of LTE, and that's something that Vish already talked about. The one gig demo, the one gig which is going into launch with LTE already, which is the first steps of a massive carrier aggregation. But then you have things like uh, lean carrier, other things that we're bringing in already to the 4G. Then they can see that what we said we would do, in other words, a broader carrier is only one part of it, but we also talked about doing distributed MIMO. We talked about multi-user MIMO, which is when you direct different MIMO streams to different devices. And we were talking about spatial separation. In other words, beam forming and how well we can do beam forming. That's what we're showing today. We're showing gradual steps to get to something that is really live and real for 5G. And we've come so far that I have no doubt that these time plans that we have promised in terms of being able to deliver pre-commercial systems to demonstrate what this technology is capable of on full scale within a year or two, I think that's, that's going to be possible. 
because we're going to show that, that that can be done. Then in parallel with that, they also see that we're making progress in the standardization. They see it and what we're doing in the standardization works together with partners like, like Telstra, where we're bringing the, the stuff into the 3GPP world, but also in the core network, in IEEE, in IETF, to make sure that this can happen. It's not only about radio, it's actually also about the core. So, so that's important. And I think we're making lots of progress and I think people are impressed by the progress that the industry does. Uh, Vich, you mentioned briefly earlier about 5G test trials in Australia and really um, what the climate there offers those test trials. 5G radio test beds, again, you might have mentioned this a little earlier, I apologize if you did, I'm asking you twice, but what were the results of that trial? Can you expand and elaborate on that? Yeah, we've been working very closely with Ericsson on their 5G test bed, and I think it's really important to understand how um, will you practically be able to deploy 5G. It comes with a new set of spectrum assets, you're going into millimeter wave, um, frequencies which uh, have different propagation characteristics and different planning factors that'll dictate the economics of how I build out coverage and capacity. And so working with Ericsson, we're able to give our engineering team more of a real world view of how that's going to work in the field. So for instance, we've been working on what line of sight looks like in terms of capacities and we've been getting great um, characterization with the Ericsson test bed, but I think the more surprising things have been the operation in non-line of sight, where we would have thought that there'd be steep drop-offs in capacity. So instead, we're seeing some significant performance gains by using things like the beam steering technologies and the reflections that come with it to still be able to maintain one to three gigabits per second when we're operating at 15 gigahertz. So those types of things are really important for us as we take a look at how we're going to build out the coverage and capacity in a 5G network build um, within the next uh, five years or so. Ulf, the importance of LTE technology to the future of 5G, can you explain that to us? Well, it's very important. I don't think that any uh, operator or, or, or uh, service provider, whatever they are, could really just start with a completely new network. This has to be built on all the assets that are there uh, we're working very hard on the evolution of LTE to make sure that it is compatible, which is software upgrades of the entire network. Uh, on top of that, we are launching the new air interface uh, that can be used in particular for higher frequencies, but could also be deployed in lower frequencies. And that's what we see in all these demos and all the uh, launches that are down here. Uh, we are demonstrating uh, 25 gigabit per second speeds in the 15 gigahertz band. As an example, uh, we're just about to move into 28 gigahertz band with the same type of radios. Um, those radios could be deployed in lower bands and it's all tied together. The key thing is that no longer is it like it was in the past where there was a certain frequency tied to a certain technology that was sort of tied to a, a certain use case. It's going to be a multiple of use cases that are independent on which frequencies you are in. The combinations of uh, different technologies like LTE in combination with, with 5G and the evolution of LTE we're going to just see a lot of combinations where the lower frequencies will be used to anchor and secure that communication works flawlessly, added capacity in higher frequencies where it's, it's more difficult to make a continuous service to happen. So I think that strategy is what we really see. Totally new flexibility in networks, totally new potential of operations for, for, uh, for service providers. I think Telstra is also one of those service providers that has a number of use cases already with industry providing communications for mining industry, for public safety and security and so on. So we learn a lot from their operations of those services and how we can build the networks that will make that work really well as one network, which is the idea behind 5G. Of course, Telstra and Ericsson uh, are known for joining forces and really guiding and developing standards for 5G network architectures. Um, where are we sort of on the standardization of 5G? And Vish, I'll start with you. Yeah, you know, I think Ulf made a, a great point um, when you look at uh, the environment in Australia, we're kind of tailor-built to be that canary in the IoT coal mine. And I think when you, when you look at what the importance of the 5G standardization process uh, will be, it's, it's going to be less about the existing ecosystem of players and much more about how do you bring these industry verticals into the mix to understand the specific requirements of what a rural uh, mine site would need. Um, or what a, an LPC or SCADA system would need to do for an oil refinery. Um, so those types of capabilities are what we need to stress test a lot more to bring them into the standardization process as we lead into the launch of 5G. 
off? Anything to add to that? Anything you'd like to add? No, I mean, absolutely right. And I, I think very, very important, if there is one message that is important, is about creating an ecosystem for all vendors and for all service providers. Then I think the differentiating factor is going to be how you utilize it, what you make out of it, your strategies for different uh, segments, for different opportunities in the marketplace. And I think we're going to see service providers developing in different directions here depending on where they really think that the future biggest business opportunities are. This is a basic technology. The telecom sector has always been based on interoperability. We're going to make a global standard for 5G. The kind of work that Telstra and Ericsson is doing is a very important piece of demonstrating and showcasing things which can be used for that standardization process. So we at TIA and TIA now view the Ericsson and Telstra collaborative partnership as one of the more powerful uh, uh, partnerships in the industry. So we appreciate both of you being here at Thank the same you. time and talking about Thank 5G one of the more progressive technologies, of course. So thanks for your time again. Thanks, Abe. Thanks, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And for all of our continued programming here at TIA Now, you can go to tianow.org and you can follow us on Twitter at TIA underscore now. So long. <laughs>